I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I have a conversation with Lala Wu, the co-founder and executive director of Sister District, a grassroots organization focused on getting Democrats elected in state legislatures. Lala and I revisit the historic confirmation hearings for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, who will be the first black woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. We also talk about the impact and the importance of having diverse representation at all levels of government. And in the second half of our conversation, we discuss what Republicans have been up to in their long game to undermine democracy, specifically as it relates to redrawing congressional maps. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with La La Wu of Sister District. La La Wu, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. So I know we're going to talk about diversity and representation today. And, you know, I think one of the best cases that I've seen recently was made during Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's confirmation hearings, right? I think that for me, it was partly due to that speech that was made on the floor by Senator Cory Booker, right? And I've been talking about that ad nauseum (laughs) on social media, but I think that is another example of the importance of representation because he was able to contextualize the importance of her nomination better than anyone else, right? You know, he made these connections about how they both got there and he was able to clarify its importance in historical context, right? What did you make of that statement and of the hearings generally? Yes, I think that you're exactly right to focus on Senator Booker's really soaring, inspiring remarks. I mean, that brought tears to her eyes, right? And I think to many others as well, to see someone as qualified as Katanji Brown Jackson, who's Harvard undergrad, law school, federal district court, circuit court, clerk for the Supreme Court, private practice, U.S. Sentencing Commission, public defender. I mean, all of these things to see someone up there with these qualifications and who, who just, by the way, happens to be a Black woman, you know, to see her up there was incredible and just filled me with immense, immense pride and I felt so inspired by it. I was also really disappointed and irate, as I'm sure you were too, to see these Republican senators like Holly and Graham and Cotton and Cruz just jump on with all of these ridiculous, you know, ideas about these child porn and so on, which just picking on her record in a completely unfair and misleading way because they all voted to confirm judges who had similar track records. And, you know, Lindsey Graham, in fact, voted to confirm Judge Jackson to the D.C. Circuit in just like less than a year ago. So, I mean, I had a lot of mixed reactions to the hearings, a lot of anger and irritation and just wishing that these children would just stop. But for overwhelmingly, it was an immense amount of pride. And I think that seeing someone this close to being in seated in the highest court in the land uh, means so much. And, you know, I was just talking to you before we started recording about how I just had my first child and she's a girl and she's six months old now. And so she doesn't, you know, know much of anything yet, but when she's old enough to understand, I know that she is going to be really inspired by Ketanji Brown Jackson, by other trailblazers who can indicate to her that she can be anything she wants to be. And it sounds trite sometimes, but it's just so incredibly true that until you see yourself reflected in some of these places, uh, you don't realize the kinds of barriers that you were placing upon yourself. Yeah, well, congratulations again on your daughter. And, you know, that you're right. That is a, that's an important part of this for a lot of us, especially parents. And, you know, I ironically just wrote a piece about that, about, you know, teaching our children the, the value of joy as a form of mm-hmm. resistance, right? And, you know, sometimes, you know, he, you know, kids, you don't want them to be angry, right? So it's just sometimes the only thing they have to latch on to is joy, but teaching them that as a tool. In our last conversation, I think we were talking about the census data, I think, and how I think one of the things that was uncovered was how racially diverse the country has become and is becoming. And, you know, we were talking about the potential backlash for some of that. And I wonder if you think that backlash in some ways is showing up in the hearings or is, or will it hinder efforts, you know, to get more people, more people of color in places like in the Senate? You know, for instance, like I think the new mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu, that was a really great example where it didn't work against her. But I just wonder how much it's going to hinder our efforts in upcoming elections. 
I think that representation matters so much up and down the ballot, like you're saying. And although we may see some kind of backlash, a kind of white supremacist folks in particular becoming very scared of, you know, losing their position in the social hierarchy as more and more people of color come to make a greater part of the population of this country. I think that the important thing to remember is that there are going to be more young people. There's going to be more people of color. We are going to be voters and we are going to be able to influence these institutions because despite the many attacks on our democracy, we still have one and we still have a strong democracy. And, you know, we could talk in a little bit about how our democracy is in fact under attack. But I mean, I think it's important to remember the positive part of this as well, which is that we can still run for office up and down the ballot. We can still vote amazing folks in who have experiences that really reflect the experiences of those that they are seeking to uh, make laws for. And that kind of representation, that kind of life experience really matters. It's so important uh, to have folks who are in positions of power that actually understand uh, the laws that they are making, and what implications that they will have. And so, you know, we've got a program at Sister District called State Bridges, and it's a newer program we launched last year. And what we do is we identify these kinds of long-term community-based power building organizations in the key states where we are working and then deploy our grassroots fundraising machine to fundraise for them directly. And we do so through an event series so that organizers and leaders of these state-based organizations like in Georgia or Michigan, Pennsylvania, where have you, come on and talk to our volunteers about what's going on in their state. And these are folks that come from these communities and are there day in, day out, not just for the elections. And we know that this kind of work that they do is really foundational to and complementary to the electoral work that Sister District does. And it's the reason that we believe so deeply in this work and are so happy to support our partner organizations is because you have to have people uh, in positions of power that know what they're talking about. Um, and, uh, and, and you can't, you know, just show up and expect to stand up a campaign in a few months that is going to capture hearts and minds. There needs to be a connection with what's going on long term. And so that's what we're trying to do is really build those bridges, build those connections. And in the course of doing so, hopefully increase the diversity of the folks who are representing us at all levels of government. You know, I should have given some more context for mentioning Michelle Wu, you know, because I know we're talking about state legislative races and the Supreme Court. And she was recently elected as the mayor of Boston. And it was another historic win. You know, she was the first woman. She was the first person of color. She was the first Asian American elected to serve as mayor of Boston. You know, but additionally, she won that race by leaning into her identity. She's amazing. And I think that it's a really good reminder of how important uh, all of our positions of government are, right? You know, we started out talking about the Supreme Court, but we need representation everywhere, right? We need it at the local level. You know, Michelle Wu is now the mayor of Boston. We need it at the state legislative level, um, you know, something that we care deeply about here at Sister District, our whole, you know, reason for being. It matters so much because the kinds of experiences that you have that are part of your identity, you bring those to to the role. And, you know, some of that stuff, just life experience stuff just can't be replaced. You know, um, you need the different perspectives. And it's not to say people who don't have certain perspectives are not good or shouldn't be part of the conversation. It's just that for so long, we have had a limited conversation at different levels of government. And it's really, we're getting better, but we need to continue to keep our gas on the pedal and stay focused on increasing uh, diversity of perspectives. I mean, I'll just give one example. We've got an amazing uh, alumni, uh, Mallory McMorrow, who serves in the Michigan State Legislature. And she also had a kid recently, uh, but she didn't 
know what to do because there was no parental leave policy for the state legislature. You know, these, it's a whole other conversation, but state legislatures as a workplace, I mean, they pay very little, you know, very few benefits. It's really part-time or part of the year. It's a whole, it's a, it's a very uh, strange thing in most states. It varies from state to state, but um, you know, Senator McMorrow was able to say, okay, look, I think that I should be able to have a leave while also serving my state. And so I am going to figure out how to do that. And that's not something that amazingly anybody else had done before because it, you know, they, they either um, had the perspective and weren't, uh, you know, felt able to raise it or they just didn't have that perspective at all because it's a lot of old white men. <laughs> exactly. You know, but I wanted to go back to, because we started off talking about the census, right, and the resulting mm-hmm. redistricting. You know, I wanted to talk to you about a case that's gotten very little attention outside of, you know, groups that focus on these things, mm-hmm. right? There were a pair of orders issued um, by Supreme Court justices who allowed congressional maps to stand in two states. It was North Carolina and Pennsylvania. So can you just explain why technically those two cases were a win for democracy? It's it's complicated. It's complicated. So it is a win uh, for letting these maps stand in North Carolina and Pennsylvania. These are two states um, that Sister District is focusing on this year, and we are committed to looking for states where we've got the best state legislative opportunities, as well as nested senatorial, um, congressional, secretary of state, governor's races, all of that jazz. And we were very happy to hear that the maps in North Carolina and Pennsylvania were, you know, going to going to stand. Uh, but the concern here is that they were not wanting to take up this idea of the independent state legislature theory quite yet, which is the theory under which Republicans have been advancing the big lie. It basically says that state legislatures have complete control over federal elections. And that means under this theory, there's no oversight from even state courts and even state constitutions can't prescribe their power. And even ballot initiatives, you know, voted on by a majority of the people can't change this power. And it's a completely, as a uh, formerly practicing lawyer myself, this theory is completely B-A-N-A-N-A-S. Like it's totally nuts and it should not be even part of the conversation, but uh, for course, Republicans know that if they just keep saying something over and over and over again, uh, you know, maybe they can get somewhere. And unfortunately, we've got a few justices on the Supreme Court that have indicated their willingness. At least three um, have indicated their willingness. Uh, I believe it's Gorsuch, Thomas, um, and, you know, we don't know what Amy Coney Barrett is going to say, but pretty concerning that the Supreme Court has indicated that they're going to take this theory, the independent state legislature's theory, seriously. Um, it, then that just has wide ranging principle uh, implications and would open up all kinds of election subversion and gerrymandering opportunities for Republicans. So the it's it's a win, definitely, in the sense that the maps are are good this year. But in the long term, we have to be a little bit concerned about what that means uh, about what might be coming down the pike from the Supreme Court. Yeah, it's kind of complicated, but it's called the independent state legislature doctrine. And it's a really fringe theory. And so are you saying it's a worry because though it didn't work this time, because they took it seriously, it could work in other states and in other cases? That's right. In this case, they basically said that they didn't want to uh, use this case as an opportunity to uh, take up the theory on the substance. And so the Supreme Court and courts do this a lot of times. Uh, Sometimes they're like, oh, this is an important question that hasn't been answered yet. But because of the procedural posture, because of how this case was brought, because of who the plaintiffs and the defendants are, any number of reasons, it's not there. We should, we're going to demur on this case. We're going to put this we're going to decline to intervene, um, which is what the Supreme Court did in this case. We're not going to get involved here, but in their reasoning in this case, they did say, you know, but this is a very, very 
wink, wink, very important question. And we're sure it will come up again. So they basically opened up the door and gave some indication to all of us in the public reading these cases, uh, you know, saying, oh, okay, this is great. We've, we've got a brief reprieve for fair maps at the moment, but um, your the fact that they're interested, they've indicated interest in taking up the independent state legislature theory in the future is deeply concerning. Yeah. So if you could just explain this to me like a toddler, <laughs> like oh, totally. how would this lock in, if they were to consider this in future cases and it were successful, how would this lock in Republican power, right, for a long time or even forever? Yeah. Well, I'll start by saying that it took me a while to really get this into my head as well, because it's so absurd. <laughs> it's so outside of the realm of what we think could be possible in our democracy that it, it truly boggles the mind. So I'll just preface it with that. And then, you know, so how the independent state legislature theory goes is that it says the Constitution gives state legislatures unfettered authority to write the rules for elections. And nothing else can impact it. Not state courts, not constitutions, not ballot measures. State legislatures just have a carte blanche to do whatever they want with regards to elections. So what that means is that in Michigan, for example, there was a uh, independent state uh, redistricting commission that was put into place by ballot initiative. You know, a majority of voters in Michigan voted to amend the constitution such that a independent redistricting commission would be developed and implemented, which is great news for democracy. Michigan is one of our target states also this year because of the independent redistricting commission and the uh, fair maps that have resulted from it. If the independent state legislature theory took hold, then the whole ballot initiative that put in place this independent redistricting commission in Michigan would be called into question. So in Michigan, the majority of voters voted on a ballot initiative, implemented a commission that makes redistricting fair in the state. That whole thing, if the independent state legislature theory were to take hold, could be called into question. And that's just one example of how the independent state legislature theory would work. Another would be that the independent a state legislature, let's say dominated by Republicans, might, uh, you know, promulgate all kinds of voter suppression laws. You know, the things we've kind of heard about before. Maybe they'll um, get rid of drop boxes, limit early voting hours, prohibit people from helping other people to vote, getting rid of disability access, getting rid of language access. I mean, the list goes on and on. Let's say that a Republican state legislature were to enact all kinds of laws like that, and someone brought some litigation that said, hey, this isn't fair, this violates our state constitution, and tried to bring it to a state court. Well, if the independent state legislature theory were in place, then the state court would have to say, we don't have any control over this. We don't have any power. Um, the state constitution that you know under which you're suing also doesn't have any power to constrain the legislature from doing whatever they want to do. So it really is, like, is an affront to the idea of checks and balances, really. You know, this idea that the legislative branch can do whatever it wants and that without regard to what the courts have to say or what the voters have to say or what their, even their constitution has to say. Yeah, that's really, really scary, actually. <laughs> You know, I, and I think, terrifying. yeah, it is terrifying, you know, and I think what people should understand, and I've probably said this before, but, you know, so forgive me for repeating myself, but Republicans are not looking to gain power in any traditional or democratic or like mainstream way. And they really don't care. They don't seem to care about winning over voters, especially with like policy, right? <laughs> you know, they care about putting systems in place to grant them this kind of unearned power, right? And, you know, of course, putting people in place who will adhere to their plans, Oh, that's exactly right. And I mean, back to the place where we started this conversation, it's because they can see the direction that the demographics are going. They can see the direction that 
the will of the people is going and it's not in their direction. And so the best thing that they can do is change the playing field, change the rule, put in place yes men who are going to do whatever they want. And unfortunately in Trumpism, they have found a pretty uh, powerful set of uh, tools. And, you know, like 2020, the aftermath of that election was just, it was a mishmash. You know, Republicans were in a panic. They were throwing everything at, a, at the wall, trying to see what stuck. But what we should be concerned about is that Republicans have now, they've regrouped and they've had time to coalesce around a very clear theory to gain power, partisan power, without any regard to what the cost is. And the cost being the foundational institutions of our democracy, right? You know, Republicans in 13 states have introduced at least 41 bills to undermine the democratic process. And these are bills that would give powers to state legislatures to review election results, power to seize control of the election process, punishment of election officials for even inadvertent and tiny errors. Uh, and so these are the kinds of things that are already having an impact, even though Many of these bills have not yet passed. They have been introduced, which means that they may be introduced again. They're starting to push the Overton window. They're starting to make this kind of conversation feel normal. And even you know, before some of these things have passed, we're getting fewer and fewer people who are wanting to be election administration officials, which is a huge problem, right? Because they're scared of what the criminal implications might be down the line. They're like, oh my gosh, why do this at all? And that's that's a huge, huge problem. We, we need everyone at all of these levels of, of democracy to do their job. And the Republican approach is really throwing a major wrench into the gears. Yeah, yeah. And and at the same time, Republicans are pushing people to take those administrative positions. You know, I think Steve Bannon apparently talks about it a lot on his podcast and encourages people. Yes, yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, to take these positions. So what are, what's the state of the maps now and what position are we in going into the midterms for this fall? So, look, the truth is that this is going to be a very challenging year for elections. And at least a sister district, the way we're thinking about it, is probably going to be our more most challenging year yet. But that doesn't mean that there aren't really amazing opportunities to hold the line and expand our gains wherever we can. Uh, you know, we're focused on Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. These are states that are great to watch. Uh, because they've got really good opportunities. We selected them in particular because they have great state legislative opportunities, uh, because the maps look pretty decent. For example, as I mentioned, Michigan before because of the Independent Redistricting Commission. Um, and also because they've got great nested opportunities, state led, uh, not only state legislatures, but governorships, you know, uh, secretaries of state, Congress, Senate, all of that. There's some really amazing opportunities out there. But in terms of you know, just to, to go deeper, a little bit of a level to look at redistricting, it has been a little bit of a mixed bag. And every state has a different process. You know, some states, the state legisl most states, state legislature is involved. Governors may be involved. Maybe there's commissions involved. Maybe the courts have gotten involved because of litigation or where, you know, the state legislatures and the governor maybe can't uh, come up with a consensus. Uh, and so it's important to know that it has been a mixed bag. And then there's a mixed bag also when it comes to congressional maps versus the state legislative maps. You know, you might have seen some people are saying, oh, the congressional maps or people are saying, oh, redistricting wasn't that bad. Actually, in general, what we're talking about there is the congressional maps. And uh, it, it, it really it really depends because the state ledge maps can be different. And as we know, state ledge is where the rubber hits the road in terms of so many policies that impact our lives. And so these maps are incredibly important. Another thing I would just point out about redistricting is that there's been a really severe drop in competitiveness. So although you look at the balance between Democrats and Republican, okay, how are the seats going to land? Like, which way are they likely to go one way or another? It looks like, oh, maybe it's not as bad as we thought it was going to be in terms of D's versus R's. But what is really different is that very few of them are competitive now, meaning they're really safe. And by the latest count, it looks like less than fewer than 40 seats out of 435 house seats are going to be competitive. And that is, I mean, that's less than 10%. That's not good. That's a really small number. And 10 years ago, that comparable number is something like 73 seats, 
right? And so when we have less competitiveness, that's bad for democracy. We need competitiveness. We need more competitive seats so that we can get better candidates who are better representative of the people that we represent. Because we know that when we have gerrymandering that puts Republicans in these safe seats, they don't feel beholden to their entire voting base. They really just care about, and they're happy to appease the extremists. So, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to uh, close on too negative of a note. So I will say that there are really, really great opportunities out there, uh, despite these big concerns, despite the fact that, you know, we're facing challenging times. I mean, look, like, we do this work when it's easy. And we do this work when it's hard. And right now, it happens to be hard. But that doesn't mean we can stop. We have to keep doing it. And there are really great opportunities out there. We just have to look for them. Well, you know, I have so many more questions for you, but anyway, we'll pick that up another time. Well, let's, uh, let's do that. Lala, we will thank you so much for all of your work and thank you for joining me today. And we'll talk as we get closer to the midterms about how things look. Okay. <laughs> okay. I would love that. Thanks so much for having me.